Death and taxes, they say, are the only certainties in life. We all know none of us are making it out of this thing alive, yet only 33% of us actually have a will or trust in place. This is a mind-bending statistic, especially when $36 trillion are expected to be transferred to beneficiaries over the next 30 years. Creating a trust can make sure that the people you care about are taken care of after you're gone. It can be life-changing for some. But what if everything doesn't go to plan with a will or trust? After all, when we are talking about large estates and you add in a good dose of human nature, there is always going to be someone that tries to take advantage. There's a whole range of valuations of the cases we deal with. Anywhere from assets of $100,000 to $20 million. People can get a little funny when it comes to money sometimes. A lot of these problems are, are human nature problems that don't necessarily make one person a hero or another a scoundrel. That's where this team comes in. Hackard Law, protecting trusts and people's wishes since 1976. If someone has tried to swindle a beneficiary, Hackard Law has seen it. They literally wrote the book on elder abuse and trust malfeasance. Over the next half hour, we'll hear about some of their most outrageous cases, at least the ones that they could actually tell us about. You'll find out where they got their passion for this kind of law. Hear about some of the most unique wills and trusts ever written, and a list of five things to protect yourself from those that would abuse your last will and testament. Hackard Law has seen some wild cases, and because they are too good to leave for last, we are going to start with the bad. We'll save the good for later. Stay with us as Hackard Law takes us on a tour of the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to wills and trusts. A lot of our cases are really interesting because you've got these family disputes and family dynamics, which I think are very human and we can all relate to to some extent. But this one was straight out of a, a TV show plot. We had a client named Jenny who came to us about her dad's estate after he passed away. Jenny was her dad's only child. She was really close with him. He had remarried to a woman who didn't like Jenny very much. Her dad had married her when Jenny was a little girl, but she never felt accepted. Her stepmom had two daughters of her own, so Jenny always felt pretty left out. It wasn't really because of her dad. I mean, she always felt close with her dad, but her stepmom wanted to keep Jenny at arm's length. Her dad would actually hide Christmas gifts that he would buy for Jenny and they would have their own private secret Christmas celebrations so that Jenny's stepmom wouldn't find out. Jenny's dad found out that he was dying of cancer. It was his second round and he kind of knew that this was gonna be it for him. And he was thinking long and hard about how to provide for his family. He owned a home with his wife and she had her own assets and he had some investment accounts that he had worked hard for. He sat down with, with Jenny many times and discussed how those accounts were gonna be hers. He told her how to get into the accounts, what to do when he passed away, who to call. She was pregnant at the time that he died with her first child. Her stepmother had found out about those accounts being in Jenny's name as the beneficiary and had gone through her dad's phone and seen where he and Jenny had texted back and forth with each other about the passwords and how to get in there. And so the passwords were all there. Jenny's stepmother had changed the beneficiary on those accounts from Jenny to herself so that when Jenny's dad died, her stepmom was to be the recipient of that. And it's a substantial amount of money. It was a few hundred thousand dollars, which is life-changing for, for most people. It's just pretty tragic, really sad for this girl who was, you know, early 20s and having her first child and lost her dad and he was 
really the only support and stability she had in her life. And she didn't want to make a big deal about it at the time because she didn't want to upset her dad. So what she did do was change the password on the account. She didn't go in and change the beneficiary designation. She just changed the password so that her stepmom couldn't get on the account anymore. Her stepmom got a notification about that and started panicking. She had actually called and impersonated her dying husband to verify the change was made to put her as the beneficiary. You know, we don't often have a, a smoking gun in this line of work. This was a unique case in that we actually had recordings of the phone calls made between the stepmom and the investment account. It was shocking. She literally impersonated him, said she was him, disguised her voice. I just keep I apologize. I've never enjoyed it. The people with the company suspected exactly what she was doing. You're positive I'm not talking with Debbie. <laughs> they ended up freezing the accounts, which was great. It stopped any payouts from happening before Jenny could get a lawyer and get help to figure this all out. It was one of the most surprising pieces of evidence we've ever come across here, and it was really helpful for our case, obviously. And she denied it. The stepmother denied that she did it. We mediated the case with a, a neutral retired judge as our mediator, and he helps both sides reach a solution. It was a great result for Jenny. She was able to recover a large portion of what her dad wanted her to get. Obviously, when you're mediating a case, there's compromise on both sides, so nobody has the total win that they would have if you won at trial. But you leave the day, and Jenny left that day knowing exactly what the outcome was. She was able to plan her future for herself and her son. We all felt like we did a good job in getting her a large portion of what her dad wanted her to have. And she said it gave her great peace of mind to have it all be over with and to know that she had a very good start for her son in life and she was able to take care of him now. My name is Joseph Nannery. I'm a, currently a private investigator and I was a San Francisco police officer for about 33 years. Retired eventually as a lieutenant. 25 of my last 33 years I was in investigations. Mike ships me a lot of cases. One case had a lot of PDFs and I started looking at this and I called Mike up and I said, Mike, are you kidding me? I, th I thought this was a joke. And I remember one day my secretary brought in this letter uh, all handwritten and it looked kind of unusual because the handwriting almost looked like maybe a third grader. I see that the letter is from a prison and says that he's inherited you know, half of his mother's multi-million dollar estate. And essentially he was written out of his mother's will. So he went to Mike and said, can you please take my case? And um, I think, I'll look at this. Uh, I'm happy to look at it. So the first thing I do, of course, go look him up and uh, find out he's in there for murder. So I think, well, maybe it's, that's not a great start. I believe he murdered his girlfriend. My first reaction looking at this, I was thinking, oh my God, what's he thinking? This, this case has got no, no legs. But I do know as a lawyer, the fact that someone has done something wrong doesn't make them ineligible per se to inherit. We run these things by people in the office, and I think everyone thought it was crazy <laughs> that I would take that case and then pointed out all the problems of the case. Well, I knew what the problems were, but you know, I look at this case closer and I say, this is, uh, this is a crazy case for lots of reasons. Among them was that the decedent, she had a lot of property and she also had millions of dollars in securities. But it turns out she was in a medical facility. And during the time she was in this facility, she wrote out a 17-word will, leaving her entire estate to her eight-year-old grandson. And I thought, hmm, an eight-year-old grandson's getting seven or nine million dollars, whatever it is. Once that boy were to reach 18 years old, all of that would be his. 
That didn't make a bit of sense. Changing her whole will and trust and bequeathing it to her eight-year-old grandson, we found out that she didn't see that often to begin with. And we found out that about 15 years earlier, the decedent mother had had a bad stroke. The mother uh, had lifelong issues after that was stroke with her speech, with her cognitive abilities. Although the mother wasn't able to care for herself, the decedent had changed the trust while she was in a care facility, fighting a, a UTI that was affecting her abilities to think cognitively. We found out by having our own medical consultant look at it, in all likelihood that this decedent had a UTI, which causes delirium, it's sa same thing as dementia. The difference is that it can be cleared up by antibiotics. We did a lot of research on that. We hired our private investigator too. I even looked back years earlier from newspapers and there was a mother in the picture of a local newspaper. She had issues with the kids. When she got mad at them, uh, she would put them both in the trunk of the car and lock them in there. Uh, that was like a, their time out. She also shackled the kids to the bed. So there was a lot of uh, moving parts to this case that explained how and why eventually in the end, maybe why this kid murdered his girlfriend. I mean, he, he did not have the best of a childhood. That's a big problem. You have a woman who's out of it, even though the psychiatrist that determined that is in federal prison. And he said, there's a little problem with the psychiatrist. And at first I thought he was kidding. He says, well, he's, he's in prison himself on gun and weapons charges, and he's earmarked, been convicted, arrested by the FBI, and he's gonna be sent off to a federal prison. And so finally, we kind of had an agreement that interviewing the psychiatrist who's now a convicted felon, that that probably wasn't our best card we were gonna bring forward. So as time went on, Mike's staff and his experts were able to see at the point where she changed her will was at about the same time that she had not been medicated for this UTI. Oftentimes the facts or something that's in the medical report or a police report is something we always strive to get. I did kind of my standard thing as far as an online mock jury trial. When I looked at that online mock jury trial, most all the jurors were like, there's no way this guy's getting the money, my client. You know, but again, I looked at it and I thought, I can find a way. He's got that the thought, that vision. He's got experts, he's got phenomenal people. He works with jury consultants and I go out and I speak with witnesses. And even when I come back with sometimes with bad news to Mike, they readjust the playbook. They, they readjust their, their action plan. And ultimately, uh, we were set for trial. So Mike was able to sit down with the judge, explain to the judge as to what was going on. And uh, the big problem is these 17 words were written on a napkin. Part of what the evidence was that we put together for the mediator was a picture of the napkin. It looked questionable. I think the big point there was the napkin with the 17 words on it, changing you know millions of dollars worth of assets in the trust to an eight-year-old. And Mike was able to get a very favorable outcome for his client. We're talking millions of dollars for his client. We're pretty good at what we do. If that hasn't changed your assumptions about the world of estate and trust law, we don't know what will. We're going to shift gears and get over to the lighter side of the law. Stay tuned for more fascinating wills and trusts. Family dynamics are at the heart of trust beneficiary disputes. The biggest disputed asset is usually the family home. Undue influence can swing millions of dollars from rightful beneficiaries to a wrongdoer. These cases are about money, often a lot of money. Intense preparation goes a long way toward resolution. Call Hackard Law today to schedule your free trust dispute consultation. We'll work to get you the money you deserve. So this is, this is one of the, the more creative wishes I, I've seen, and I actually sort of admire it in a way. Dr. Frederick Bauer created the packaging for the Pringles chips, the sort of iconic tube that I recall very fondly from my childhood. He desired for his ashes to be placed in a Pringles can when he died, and I love this. I think can't think of anything more perfect for somebody like that, especially because we actually do often fight over ashes in the cases. Uh, it's a very common thing that we deal with, so I, I like the Pringles can story. 
After passing in 1881, Jonathan Jackson's will ordered his executors to erect a very special home for his cats. Its most notable features included dormitories, a communal dining area, grounds for exercise, gently sloping roofs for climbing, and rat holes for sport. It even had an auditorium where the cats were assembled daily to listen to an accordion because Jackson said it was the natural musical language of cats. That's nice. That's a good, that's a good life for a cat. Well, uh, I've, I've seen cat cases before. <laughs> I've seen where uh, people who are logical people, loving people, but didn't have any relatives, left everything for the benefit of their cat. I think the lucky cat. I wonder if there would be somebody put in charge of the money for the cat, right? I mean, can't, you're not just going to put a bank account with a cat's name on it. But the cat probably doesn't even know, you know, it's just eating the same cat food uh, and the money goes on some point in the future. And I suppose it kind of gets down to if that's the way he wants to leave his money, he can leave his money to the cat house. You just got to put the right person in charge of the money and make sure you trust them to fulfill those wishes. More power to him. The famous Houdini set up a provision of his will to direct his wife to hold a seance once a year for 10 years to see if during that seance Houdini would cross back over to meet her. And this apparently was given his obsession with the spirit world and, and proving that as, as false. After trying to contact Houdini for 10 straight years, Bess Houdini finally told reporters from the New York Times, 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. <laughs> That's great. I wonder if her inheritance was conditioned on her doing those seances every year. Because I don't know that that would be something that you could enforce. I suppose if we're honoring the true value of a will or a trust to uh, respect someone's freedom and autonomy to direct what they'd like, then this would be one of the more eccentric wishes that someone honored under a will. It's a little impossible, I think, to make somebody trying to communicate with you in your death a condition of, of inheriting the money. I would recommend against a provision like this and maybe advise them to suggest this outside of a legal document. Apparently, Kris Jenner is interested in, in saving her bones when she dies so that someone can make jewelry out of it. That one's uh, rather morbid. This would certainly not be my preference, um, but I suppose this is, this is her body. And if the uh, family has the resources to do it and has some taste to make some jewelry out of it, then well, so be it. I think it's creepy, um, but certainly, you know, you're entitled to request anything you want done with your remains that's legal. It's just strange how certain people approach death. I don't think I'd do that estate plan. I think I'd send them to a lawyer that I don't like. Less than a year before his death, Benjamin Franklin added an addendum to his will. In it, he bequeathed 1,000 pounds sterling to the cities of Boston and Philadelphia to be used to fund loans for young tradesmen starting out in business. As the second century of Franklin's trust drew to a close, Boston's trust fund was worth 4.5 million. Philadelphia's was worth 2 million. From 1962 to 1976, loans totaling 3,476,000 went to 1,749 young people who, at the time of receiving help, were mostly living at bare subsistence level. Benjamin Franklin's plan to have them have to sit on that money was really, really smart. I think the Benjamin Franklin Trust was fascinating, and, and it just shows the kind of prescience that he had to look downstream and think about the compound value of money. Well, it, it sounds like this was the best case scenario <laughs> for a trust to, to last uh, two centuries and to help so many people. I admire that someone is thinking about, you know, how they're going to utilize what they've earned in life for the benefit of others, even if the others are going to be born 50 or 100 years from now. And it's fascinating and, and certainly that's another part of the human condition. That one, that's one that you look at and admire. 
I was interested in history and had been admitted to a graduate program in history. I told my dad about it and he said, well, I don't know how you're gonna pay for it, but good luck to you. And he said, but if you wanna to go to law school, I'll help pay your way through. So my desire to become a history professor went away quickly. And I got into law school and that's how ultimately I became a lawyer. Mike Hackard has owned and operated his own law firm for over 40 years. Over the past 10 years or so, Mike has transformed the firm into a trust and estate litigation firm. I knew somehow in the back of my mind that I always wanted to do estate and trust litigation because I'd done it early in my career. Mike brings broad and extensive knowledge from many different fields, which is tremendously helpful to our cases because knowledge of those areas is critical in understanding strategic decisions, knowing what experts to bring in. It's critical to, to every case. I can still remember the phone call on a Saturday morning from my mother. Her aunt, whom she was very close with, had died. I picked up my mom, we drove over to San Francisco, and when we got there, we met the caregiver at the door of her aunt's house. The caregiver had announced that the house was then hers. All of the family heirlooms, pictures, etc., on the same day that the aunt died, were in garbage cans. I was a litigator, but I wasn't an estate and trust litigator at that time. So I had to refer it over to someone else. The case went on really for years, and my mother's share in the case, which had been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, a check was given to her of about $5,000. My mom died about a week later. That case just brought home to me the shame of what elder financial abuse can do. I did feel that frustration. When you're frustrated, you try to find an outlet for it. And my outlet is I learned a lot about this area of law, and I feel very comfortable in it now. I wrote the book, The Wolf at the Door. It has to do with people's vulnerability to undue influence, to having their assets taken, to having their will overcome by the efforts of another. I don't like bullies. I don't like people that think that they're so powerful that they can run over another or that they can intimidate another. It makes me feel like, I I'm gonna show you that you're not gonna do this. I'm not intimidated. I don't try to bully back, but it's more like, this isn't gonna work for you. <laughs> This is our studio. This is where we shoot our videos. We make content to engage anyone who wants to find out about trust and estate litigation. We have over 700 videos up on YouTube. I just hear from people all the time how helpful that is to them and you know, looking through the subject matter. We receive dozens of calls every week from people that have estate or trust issues. And almost universally, there is a sense of embarrassment. Sometimes people say, I'll bet you never heard one like this. And I'll say, why, probably two times this morning. I think that gives people some comfort. We hire a consultant to do online mock jury trials. And those are fascinating. We may have 200 jurors listen to a set of facts. You can see out of that the strengths of your case and, and its weaknesses. That, I think, means a lot to me because I am their advocate. That, that's big for me. That's the, that's the bully thing. They've seen it. They've seen me in the battle. They've seen me in the fight. And I was for them, and they saw it. Well, 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 clearly trusts and wills are not as straightforward as we all thought. But never fear, the Hackard Law Team has come up with the five things you should never do when setting up your trust. That's coming up right after this break.
My name is Dan Collins, and I have served as a court appointed representative over companies, states, and individuals for many years. I work with a lot of different attorneys in different disciplines, and what I enjoy about working with Hackard Law is they afford people the opportunity who do not have money to pay attorneys to be able to get access to what is rightfully theirs. Call Hackard Law today to schedule your free trust dispute consultation. We'll work to get you the money you deserve. After practicing so many years, there are five things that I would never do. And one is don't entrust a step parent to take care of your biological children because things change. And maybe the step parent wants to do that, has every intention of doing it, but time goes on and the step parent feels snubbed or whatever happens. When you pass away, your spouse then, if they have complete control over all of the assets, is naturally going to feel like maybe they favor their own children, don't maybe have the same strength of relationship with yours that they did while you were alive. I think it's always a really good idea to make specific provisions for your children after you die. Put it into the trust as to what's to happen and when biological children are vested. That's a very important point because we litigate that point all the time. not a good idea to leave all of your assets to one child with direction for that child to split those assets up because what happens is the one child may think you know my sister deserves this but my brother doesn't deserve that it's just it really shouldn't be in their discretion to do it it should be in the estate plan people can get a little funny when it comes to money sometimes i'll take care of my brothers and sisters don't you worry mom We've seen that one plenty. Don't appoint someone as a successor trustee just because they're your accountant or your friend or one of your siblings. Seek out the right person to be your trustee. You gotta have somebody in charge who wants to do it, who's capable, who has the time, who can withstand some of the pressure of doing it. It's a big job, it's a big undertaking. Whoever becomes a trustee really has a serious obligation to take care of the beneficiaries according to the way that you wanted. Oftentimes you see this where a parent will transfer real estate, say into a child or a sibling's name with this idea, of, look, it's still gonna be my property. It's just in your name to help protect me. You're gonna get it anyway, and then when I pass away, I want you to split the property up between you and your siblings. And that's not a good idea. I've seen the cases where those assets are transferred, and then whoever the parent is that transferred the assets is treated like an interloper by the person who then has the asset. It's just not a very good idea. Don't expect that the trustee of your trust is going to treat your children like you would. So people create these health, education, maintenance, and support trusts. The discretion on that is so wide and you end up with such weird circumstances. I remember I was working on a case that was, I think it was about $7 million. It was a so-called HEMS trust and the trustee in that case, after the father died, decided that what's reasonable, around 40,000 a year. So there's $7 million that even at 10% is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and you have a trustee who has a misguided notion as to what her duties are. The duty is to look out for that beneficiary. The trust is made for the beneficiary, not for the trustee. We took that one on, of course, and we succeeded. <laughs> You could imagine why there is so much controversy sometimes with your assets when you're gone. And a lot of people have seen that with other family members who've passed away. It's rarely as smooth as you'd want it to be. There's so many different things to think about that it's always really a good idea to seek out counsel and get advice 
and play out different scenarios. I think it helps a lot to go to a professional because a professional will have seen the kind of problems that can exist in estate planning.